Making It Grow is brought to you in part by Santee Cooper, South Carolina's state-owned electric and water utility. More information on green power and energy conservation programs online at SanteeCooper.com. The South Carolina Department of Agriculture, reminding you that certified South Carolina agricultural products help make South Carolina grow. McLeod Farms in Macby, South Carolina. This family farm offers seasonal produce, including over 22 varieties of peaches. Glory Foods, celebrating Southern food with a soulful heritage. Glory Foods, a way of inviting South Carolina back to the dinner table. FTC Diversified, a proud part of your local communities, providing communication, entertainment, and security. Art Fields, a 10-day art competition in Lake City, South Carolina. Additional funding provided by International Paper. Oh, those wonderful afternoon thunder showers that if you're lucky enough, you get one. But at the South Carolina Watermelon Day at Clemson Extension's um, Research Center down in Blackville, they reminded us that farmers are the, more often the target of lightning strikes than any other group of people, and that would be gardeners too. So if you're in the garden and that thunder shower comes with a lot of thunderstorm, thunder crackling all around you, you go inside and be safe for another day. And we're glad you're safe inside tonight and joining us. I'm Amanda McNulty with Clips and Extension, and we're here for an hour of gardening advice on making it grow. Teresa Lott is in the chat room, and she would love to have some company as soon as we'll go inside. She'll tell you how easy it is to join her in the chat room and talk to all the fun people who like to hang out in there. You know, we take grand trips with Making It Grow, and we went back to one of our favorite places in the upstate Spartanburg and visited the new downtown campus. It's a, a repurposed building um, for um, Spartanburg for Spartanburg Technical Co Community College, and what a remarkable landscape you will see there, done with more care than we often see, and it really does show in the way that it looks. We're so lucky tonight that Jackie Moore of the South Carolina Specialty Foods is back with us, and she's got a grand guest who's just got a wonderful life. She gets up every morning and starts milking goats before she goes off to her regular job, and the things that she thinks about to do with that goat milk will just make your mouth water. Of course, Dr. John Nelson with the University of South Carolina's A.C. Moore Herbarium will be with us answering well, he answers questions for us about what plants are, but tonight he's going to puzzle us about what a plant is, and I hope our panel will be able to get the right answer. We also have a grand panel here tonight. They are ready to answer your questions, so let's go inside and meet our guest. And Ms. Teresa Lott, who is a water quality um, specialist, and she is based in Florence. And Teresa, when we have these incredible gully washers. I just sometimes worry about what's being carried down to the streams and lakes and what can we do to try to keep our favorite outdoor recreational places clean enough that we can fish and swim. Good evening, Amanda. I'm so glad you asked. You are absolutely right. Whenever we have rain, even if it's just a tiny amount, anything that's left on the ground can make its way into those water bodies that we love so much. I know I enjoy, uh, especially the lakes, to do some recreational activities on the weekends. We want to keep them clean and safe. And one thing you can do is to clean out debris that might accumulate on your storm drain. You can shut off that sprinkler because we probably won't need to use it in the near future. And even check your weather report before applying fertilizer or pesticides. We want to protect our water quality and protect those beneficial insects as well. Speaking of beneficial insects, today's photo of the day from our Clemson 100 years celebration is of a master gardener, Allison Daly, and she is sharing a special native pollinator house that she built as part of the Garden Gathering. That's one of Amy Dabb's programs down in the Charleston area. This was in 2013. You can see Clemson's 100 years photo of the day every day on the Clemson Extension Facebook page. They also have a website. 
Now let's get down to business. I hope that you plan on chatting with me. Go to the Making It Grow Facebook page. It's easiest to do that on your computer rather than your mobile device. Click on the green Let's Talk icon. You'll be directed into the chat room where we already have nine speakers, three viewers. You can log in with Twitter or Facebook and we'll be chatting right away. Amanda, back to you. Thank you, Teresa. I'm glad you got such a good crowd already. That bodes well for the evening. And another thing that bodes well for the evening is that we have a debut tonight with one of our new Clemson Extension agents, and that's Jackie Jordan. And you are the horticulture agent, and I think you're dividing your time between two counties. Where are you? Actually, three counties. Three. Richland, Kershaw, and Fairfield counties. Well, all lovely counties. Mm -hmm. And how about, do you have some nice master gardeners that you wonderful. kind of inherited? Oh, wonderful master gardeners. <laughs> that really is the nicest thing about being a hort mm -hmm. agent, isn't it? Yeah. It is. Well, have y'all been getting lots of questions in the offices lately? We have um, lots of questions about vegetables, tomatoes especially are oh, popular, yeah. green beans. A lot of people are growing their own vegetables, so that and a lot of questions about lawn care. Yeah, it was a tough winter, wasn't it? It was. People are still seeing problems with mm -hmm. that. A lot of winter kill. And Jonathan Croft is with us. Jonathan is an ag agent, that's what we call him, <laughs> agronomy is your specialty, although you are a pretty good tomato grower too. Mm -hmm. but, um, a little bit of everything. Yeah. <laughs> that's kind of the way all of us are, isn't it? <laughs> that's yeah. right. And Jonathan, um, are you, you're based in Orangeburg, I believe. How wide an area are you trying to help farmers with? I cover Orangeburg County and pretty much anywhere else I'm called to go to uh -huh. in that area, but it's We've been pretty dry down there, so it's kind of slowed down a lot of things. And mm -hmm. those that were lucky and got some rain do have a pretty good crop going right now. And when I left this afternoon, we were getting some more rain. So it's we really need it, so it was good to see. I know. It's one thing when a home gardener doesn't have a good, bountiful, pro, um, you know, a good crop. crop to bring in, yeah. but it's for these guys it's really serious and we mm -hmm. hope after last year with the, the flooding Flood, now this year we got a lot of dry weather. Well so. I hope that some of your farmers so are gonna have better we'll results. Have, we'll have good results. Yep. We sure do. And also tonight we're so happy to welcome back our dear friend Jackie Moore from the South Carolina Department of Agriculture Specialty Foods Association. And Jackie, I think you've got a special treat for us tonight. I do Amanda I have a very special treat for us. Not only are they members of the Certified South Carolina Program and the South Carolina Specialty Food Association, they are part of the newest program at the Department of, Agri of Agriculture, the Agritourism Program. So I'm very happy to welcome Melinda Cole. She's with Fishing Creek Creamery and she's out of Chester. Welcome. Hi Jackie, thank you. And why don't you tell us uh, where Fishing Creek Creamery came from? Well, Fishing Creek Creamery is located in Chester, South Carolina. It's right off of uh, Interstate 77, uh, north of Columbia, south of Rock Hill. And uh, we got started with our dairy when my husband discovered that he was lactose intolerant. And so he can have goat milk. He can have goat milk, yes. We were looking for cow milk alternatives and then we discovered goat milk and then all the wonderful things that you can do with goat milk. And it's a lot less fattening. Right? Yeah, it's, it's got less fat than cow milk. Well, we are excited about later in the show to learn all these wonderful dishes that you can use your goat milk yes. with. Yes. Back to you, Amanda. Thank you, Jackie. Now we're going to check in with our favorite professor at the University of South Carolina, the curator of the AC Moore Herbarium, and that would be none other than old JB, John Nelson himself. John, thank you for joining us tonight. Well, thank you, Amanda, for having me. I'm glad to be here How, and um, John, talk I was, about some mystery plants. Well, I was going to ask you, too, um, if your puppy dogs that we see are um, bothered by the thunderstorms. Uh, they don't like storms, as I understand it. Uh, most dogs don't really like thunder, but um, they, um, well, they don't, yeah, I mean, what can you do? They don't like the storms too much, uh, but we try to keep them... Uh, away from the windows and that kind of stuff. Good. Well, John, um, you do such a great service for us, um, helping us find out what the mysteries in our yard are, and remind our viewers of, if they have something they'd like to have identified, how they can get in touch with you, please. Okay. Um, it's real easy, and uh, all one has to do, if you have an unknown plant or a weed or a house plant or something that's showing up in your garden, you want to know what it is, give us a call or send us an image as an uh, email attachment. It's very easy. We get these things all the time. Just send um, a JPEG image or whatever to um, the email address there, or you can call me up. And now sometimes people will bring me a specimen if they're close enough to Columbia. We can run downstairs 
I'll send one of my little um, students down to pick it up. You don't have to look for a parking place. <laughs> All right, John. Thank you so much. And we'll um, come back later and see if you've got a real puzzle for us tonight, if it's one that won't be too hard. It's a real pretty one. Okay. Thank you so much. And we actually have our first caller. So here you go. You ready? Right. Okay. Yes. Brenda's calling us from Hartsville. Brenda, thanks for calling us. And how can we help you? Well, thank you, Amanda, for taking my call. Um, I've got a garden area that I've had for several years, and I finally give up this year because the weeds, the nutgrass, mm -hmm. and all has just took it over. Mm -hmm. What I want to know is if I treat it now to kill all the weeds and stuff in there, will I be able to plant again next year? And what's the best thing to use to kill the nutgrass? Oh, that nutgrass is a problem. Mm -hmm. And I think there's a product that's labeled for that. Um, well, it depends. Does she want, if she wants to put vegetables back in that spot, then you're going to be very limited. You're going to want to stick with either Roundup or smothering it with cardboard. Mm -hmm. um, if it's going to be more of a landscape area, then you do have more choices. Okay. And um, so even though she's, she wanted, but if you read the labels on there, will they tell you how long it is before you have to repl you can replant? They will, but you're going to wait at least a year or more with some of those herbicides. So do read the label um, and, and make that decision. If you want to do vegetables, I would strongly suggest smothering it with cardboard, um, plastic, or you know, going in there and, and spraying around. That up. wonderful lasagna gardening method that mm -hmm. Amy Dabbs mm -hmm. likes to teach. Oh, yeah. Jonathan, do you have anything to add to that? Uh, Jackie hit, all the, hit it all on the okay. nail on the head there with the, with the answer. Read that um, label. Yes. yes. And, of course, I think and glyphosate, which is the name that we call Roundup goes by. Um, I think it has a pretty, sh it, I think the time for replanting is shorter on mm -hmm. that one, but again, that information will be on the label. It is, and usually um, if you use Roundup, you can come back in within 48 hours, 72 hours and plant. So. Okay, so that would be the fastest, but with mm -hmm. that nutgrass, maybe the smothering method to really get it, because that's a smothering tough, Smothering is tough, probably tough going to be buttered in her hound up for so yeah. good. Yeah, yeah, that's true. Okay, well, Tommy's calling us from Hepzibah, Georgia. What a great place to live, it sounds like. I hope it's a great place to live, and what's going on in your garden down there? Hi, uh, how you doing? My name is Connie. Oh, I'm sorry, uh, Connie. Excuse me. Uh, we are growing collard greens this year, but something is eating them up, and we have tried everything in the world to get rid of them. And we've used seven dust and everything. We did the soap water thing, but they still keep coming back. So okay. I was wondering how will we do to get rid of them. Okay, they're getting eaten up, and are you seeing what's doing it? Is it the little worms? We can't thing on them. We don't see any bugs or anything on the leaves. We've looked at the bottom and the top, and we did everything we could. Put it seven dust. We did the soapy water thing, okay. and they're still eating them. So I was wondering if you had any answers for me Alrighty. as to what I could do. Okay, let's see what we can do. Um, have any suggestions for her? Well, with, um, with collard greens, you know, you really have to identify the pest first. Certain things will work. If it's a caterpillar, you know, BT products will work. Um, but if it's something else, a beetle that's getting in there, she's really very limited. You really do have to identify the pest first to make it effective. And um, I think I would just try to go out, Connie, um, at different times of the day, um, perhaps very early in the morning. Mm -hmm. and look. Yeah. And you've been looking under the leaves. That's good. Sometimes those little worms are so small when they're first eating, if it's those little loopers, that they're hard to see. Um, I know there are certain seven dust is something that we tend to steer away from because of its possible effect on bees. Will you mm -hmm. want to address that for us, please? It, without knowing exactly what she's got, it's hard to really tell her what to put out there. We don't want to kill our beneficial insects with mm -hmm. a broad spectrum insecticide. Mm -hmm. So if she can get those, take those plants to her local extension office there in Georgia, I'm sure they can uh, they try and find able. what's on mm -hmm. those plants. Um, may actually take looking in plant debris around the base of the plants and see if anything's hiding under there. So. There you go. Good idea. Yeah. So, okay. yeah. I'm sure. Just I have would to do a little more investigating on okay. that one. Yes. All right. Um, Lily is calling us from a beautiful coastal city, Georgetown, and we're glad to hear from you tonight, Lily. Um, what's happening that we might be able to help you with? All right. Thank you. Have you got a question? No, that's it. I'm just got the question with my mom, you know, What I'm saying. My mother gave one of her friends a piece of the tree. Yes. And hers, I mean, it blooms tree every, plum come on it every year. And not a worm be in hers. Oh, goodness. Not a worm. Uh, and it's a peach tree? A plum. A, a plum. plum tree, okay. Um, mm -hmm. But your, does yours have, have worms on it? 
together, the ones that, um, at my mother's house that has worm, but she give her friend a piece of the tree, mm-hmm. and, I mean, hers come out every year, pretty plums. But mom, okay, with hers, all right. She has worms in it. Okay. Well, they usually do get um, they the, usually do. Mm-hmm. plum cucullios, and mm-hmm. um, so I don't know why. Her mother's friend is fortunate no. enough not to have them. She's just blessed. Yes. <laughs> she, but, she may be far enough away from wild plums yes. or a source of where those or insects knocking, are coming, yeah, where from. They're coming from. Mm-hmm. And if that tree has been established in her mother's yard for a period of time, they probably have a lot of those insects uh, inoculum around there, a lot of insects well, overwintering. How about one of these home orchard sprays, if you follow the directions on that? wouldn't That is something that can be used mm-hmm. safely by the homeowner. And, yeah. and that would help. And, and uh, cleaning up any plums that have fall to the ground, yes. okay. cleaning those up and, and just cleaning up that debris under that tree would help a lot too. So sanitation, mm-hmm. getting that stuff away. Yeah, they'll actually continue part of their life cycle in the soil, so oh. get rid of them. Well, thank Good you. Good cleanup. Oh, so that's really, in this case, it really does make a difference, mm-hmm. doesn't it? Okay. Um, those plums are good, but sometimes you do have to do some work to enjoy a nice juicy one um, to get to it before those plum cuculios do. All right, um, Teresa, I think that we're going to come over to you and find out what the big topic in the chat room is. Well, we are having a fabulous time in the chat room, already up to 19 speakers and 9 viewers, so really excited. The more the merrier, so if you haven't joined in, there's of course still plenty of time, and we welcome you, although I'm already having trouble keeping up with the conversation. But someone asked a question about if you can put newspapers in your compost pile, and I'm so glad that question came up because composting is fabulous. We want to keep those scraps out of the landfill, and you can actually make something useful. It's going to help your garden to hold nutrients better and to hold moisture better so it's an all-around win-win situation and yes indeed you can put newspapers in there want to shred them up though to reduce that surface area so it'll be better uh, able to decompose and not get everything clogged up in your compost pile the home and garden information center has lots of great information there so go to clemson.edu hgic and you can find out more about composting or whatever your gardening question may be amanda back to you Thank you, and don't forget that those newspapers are good for exactly what you were just telling oh, us. Yes. Smothering. Smother those weeds. <laughs> <laughs> um, and now we're going to go to Dr. John Nelson and find out about the puzzling mystery plant. Dr. John? Amanda, we have a really pretty plant tonight. It just makes me uh, think of summer in the mountains. Oh. And it's a plant that's in the uh, buttercup family. It doesn't look like a buttercup. Um, and uh, it has, uh, it grows in, in forests. You see it along sides of the road every now and then. You could see it along the Blue Ridge Parkway, um, in fact, if you are going to be taking a trip up there. But it has great big old leaves, beautiful dark green leaves that are much divided, and uh, they're all down at the bottom of the plant. And this time of year, it's starting to send its uh, candle-like spikes uh, way up into the air sometimes up to like six or seven feet tall. And uh, the flowers are very uh, small and they do attract a lot of bugs. The interesting thing about this plant is that um, it's very close relative. Uh, In Europe, there's another species that grows in Europe of this same genus um, that they used to use to stick in their uh, mattresses (laughs) to keep the bed bugs out. I thought uh, maybe they were like going to take a vacation to New York City or something <laughs> like that. But um, yeah, so this is uh, the relative now, not so much this one, but the relative is thought to be a good um, insect repellent. Hmm. Hmm. But now our plant is, um, <clears throat> it's a really a, a sort of a summer favorite for the southeast at uh, relatively high elevations in South Carolina. And in North Carolina, it's mostly found in the Piedmont counties and also in the mountains. Um, <clears throat> it's just gorgeous. I love this stuff. And I, I understand that it's not very easy to grow in gardens, <clears throat> but I don't know. Well, you've got me on this one, John, and yeah. I used to love to spend my summers in the mountains. Um, He's got me t- as yeah. well. Do you have any of those sure. wonderful, awful puns or anything to help us with this? Well, one? I guess the deal is that... Um, if a bug doesn't like it, like something, uh, that something would be its bane. Oh, um, oh! Burbane. The dog this doesn't is a, like it. Yeah. 
Yeah. Say it loud. <laughs> dog vein. Dog vein. Well, it's bug vein. Oh, bug vein. Oh, bug vein. Oh, okay. I, was, I was looking at your dog for so long, I forgot. <laughs> okay, wonderful. Bug vein. Oh, and so that's why its relative was used in. Well, isn't that delightful? Well, John, right. does it have an unpleasant fl um, smell or fragrance or anything? Uh, you know, I don't think it really has much of a, this particular species doesn't have much of a smell, and I have collected it, and I don't remember that it was particularly smelly. <clears throat> it has been used as a medicinal plant in the um, Appalachians for a long time. Okay. <clears throat> I guess last thing I want to say is I want to thank my buddy Will Stewart for providing these beautiful pictures for us tonight. They are beautiful. Well, that was fun, and um, I'm glad to hear that it's hard to grow. I won't waste my money on it um, because I certainly don't live in the higher elevations. It's been hot as Hades where I am in St. Matthews. And I'm glad you, you gave us a reminder of how just of how wonderful South Carolina is. We have so many different areas and such a great diversity. And um, it's fun for you to share them with us. And we look forward to sharing another one with you next week. Well, I'm glad to do that. And you are right. This is a fantastic state to live in. All righty. Thank you. Um, we've got a caller from Roebuck, and Noah is calling us. Noah, we're awfully glad to talk to you. What's going on up there in Roebuck? Hi. Well, uh, first, Amanda, I'd like to say we love your hats. My family, we adore <laughs> them. They're breathtaking. Well, I hope we, they, won't, disappoint, I hope we won't disappoint you tonight. <laughs> well, what's going on well, in your... How, how can we help you with your garden? Well, I've got a problem. Um, I tried to do tomato plants this year for the first time. Well, I went to the store mm -hmm. and uh, I picked one up, and it had a it had a tag on it. Yeah. It said it was a tomato plant, but when I took it home and planted it, you know, waited a little while and I gave it some water and everything. Well, it started growing little yellow flowers on it and um, I, I got really confused because I thought it was supposed to grow tomatoes and so I just pulled it up out of the ground because I figured they gave me the wrong thing. Um, do you know why that would be? <laughs> um, well, you were, um, you were too, um, you jumped the gun. Mm -hmm. Would you like to give him a little tutorial on tomato plants? The, the tomatoes are formed from a yellow, it's a yellow flower on tomato plants. And like you say, Amanda, he just got a little too quick there. It's going to take um, 75 days to 80, 90 days, depending on the variety that you have, to actually get a full ripe tomato. If you're seeing those yellow flowers, give it another 10 days or so, and you ought to be able to see some little green tomatoes on there. Mm -hmm. So it's actually, if you could find a tomato um, in, in a store that was still looking pretty healthy, that if somebody had some little ones still out there, it's not too late for the second crop. And some people actually go out there and root them. Um, you can see how to do that. You could call your local office and how to do that. It's getting kind of kind of pushing the envelope, but you've still got a little time, I think, to put one still out there. still got a little time. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. And so um, just be excited when you see those little yellow flowers because that is the first step to having that wonderful M&M &M mayonnaise and mater sandwich a little bit farther <laughs> down the road. Um, Joyce is calling us from Easley, a great little town up there close, and that's where Corey Tanner lives with his wife and their baby daughter. Um, Joyce, how can we help you tonight? Yes, uh, my, thank you. I'm glad, to, I'm glad you're taking my call. The little one, Cypress, mm -hmm. uh, they're trying, they're turning brown from the inside out to the stem. I went around last fall pulled all the little cocoons off that I could get to, and I don't know if that's what it is or not. Is there any way that you can save them? So they're turning brown going towards the center of the plant? They're coming out from the main trunk going out toward the end of the, okay. the branch dying. Okay. Well, you, were, um, you did a good job by going and plucking those plucking those bagworms off, but I think she's got another problem. And I just wish that people would stop selling Leland Cypress and stuff. Oh, no. Yes. There, there's a, a terrible canker disease that affects them. Um, it's more serious during drought conditions anyway. They're not very drought tolerant trees. One of the best things you can do is just make sure that you're giving that tree adequate water. But uh, once it's infested, I'm afraid that there's really nothing she can do. Depends on how bad. Yeah, if it's just starting, 
Um, you can print out some of those branches and really water it, give it a good thorough watering about an inch and a half a week or so. Um, but if it's really gone, no, unfortunately. And um, you if, know, it's, if it's starting from the inside out, it may actually be the, the needle blight, the yeah. Cicospor needle blight. And there are some homeowner fungicides that, that are labeled for cypress trees that she could try. Um, if hard that's, to spray. It's hard to spray, yeah. hard to get it in there to get coverage. Yeah. Um, the other thing I've seen, if, if they have a sprinkler that's spraying on this tree, mm -hmm. that can really if they be, can dang. angle that so it's not hitting the foliage, um, get it down on the ground, uh, change over to a drip system, that would be even better. Keep that mm -hmm. canopy as dry as they can because that's, if it is the needle blight, that's helping spread that disease. And we have fact sheets at Clemson HGIC on Leland Cypress diseases, and you could go and by reading them carefully and looking at the conditions of your tree, I think you could self-diagnose yeah. it mm -hmm. and make a determination as to whether or not you might want, might need to go ahead and remove that tree and plant it with something else. Call your local extension office and talk to them about a replacement tree because there are things that are long-lived and easy. And I feel like if you've got something that's going to be so prone to disease year after year, you may want to go ahead and... Oh, yeah, that's a great over. alternative. Yeah. Okay. Um, Charles is calling us, and Charles is in Piedmont, South Carolina. Charles, we're happy to talk to you tonight. What's happening up there in Piedmont? Well, it's beautiful up here. My subject has to do with uh, what I call climbing butter beans. Uh -huh. Last year, I planted them, all vines, no blossoms, no beans, too much water, I was told by my county agent. Mm -hmm. This year, I planted them, vines, blossoms, beans. The beans started to form. Everything stopped. The, the vines are still beautiful, growing. No beans. No beans. It's been this way for about three or four weeks. Hmm. What's and, my problem? And you've, um, has it been dry? Have you been irrigating some? Uh, I've watered them. Uh-huh. And how about fertilizing? And, um, have you been putting a lot of nitrogen on them, or what's happening? No, no, no I've, I've held off on the nitrogen. Okay, that's good, that's mm -hmm. good. Well, anybody got any thoughts? The last few weeks has been extremely hot, mm -hmm. uh, and the nighttime temperatures have been up pretty good as well. I just wonder if maybe that's some pollination issues there with those uh, flowers. And they're just dropping before they actually set the And even pods. though I think beans are self-pollinating, mm -hmm. they still, still have the to have viable killing. pollen. Yep. Mm -hmm. um, I went up last um, Saturday to um, Roger Wins in Little Mountain for the um, for his tomato heirloom tomato festival, and he told me several years ago that I was growing Kentucky Wonders, and that those beans can't take heat, um, and he had me switch to one that was from Southern Alabama. Mm -hmm. okay. And southern Alabama bean has just done great, even in the heat. And so I actually made a switch. So you may want to, Charles, um, look for, um, I, I went to one of the um, Southeast Seed Savers or one of those mm -hmm. Ireland mm -hmm. catalogs and looked for some beans that said, good hot weather producer. And if I were you, I think I would try that next year. Look for a climbing butter bean. And we may even, if you want to check with Millie Davenport at Clemson, she's in charge of our heritage, wonderful seeds collection up there and Millie who's in the Pickens office might have a suggestion for you that you could try um, she's a good gardener and I think she might be able to help you out I'm sorry that you don't aren't gonna have a great big old bowl of butter beans because there's not much better but I wouldn't give up on them yet though if he still has healthy vines they yeah. they, they could flower again right. and if the as the weather changes cool, yeah. he might still just, since they look mm -hmm. so healthy just keep them mm -hmm. up there for a while they're yep. not going to do any trouble well we are going to go and learn about something that doesn't have anything to do with butter beans but it sure does have a lot to do with wonderful eating and while i make my way to the side counter we're going to check back in with teresa and see what kind of crowd they're up to now in the chat room teresa my goodness, Amanda, I just cannot keep up, which is a wonderful problem, and it's also great that other people are chiming in and answering questions and sharing their gardening knowledge. Sometimes we get questions about garden pests. We had a post, a message on our Facebook page this week by Kevin Hill, who said his poblano and bell and jalapeno peppers were being devoured by something. But we didn't know what that something was, and then he uncovered this little critter hiding in an onion. 
And Extension Agent Tony Melton shared with me that this is an army worm and it has a huge appetite. They get their name even though they're caterpillars. The army part comes in because once they devour one crop, they kind of mass together and uh, march, so to speak, to find another food source. And one way you can control these is with a certain type of bacterium. It's called Bt, and uh, you can look for that in various name brand products. But do be sure that you correctly identify your pest before you try to control anything. That is the first step always, is to know your um, critter or know the thing that is causing the problems. Let's check in now with Amanda and her guests at the side counter. Thank you, Teresa, and it's a happy day for us at Making It Grow when Jackie Moore makes the trip over from Columbia, where she works with the South Carolina Department of Agriculture with specialty foods, and now a new part of her job, too. Jackie, welcome, and tell us about our wonderful guest tonight. Well, thank you, Amanda. It's always a pleasure to be here. And yes, I have a very special guest. She's not only certified South Carolina, but part of the specialty foods. She is also at Agritourism Site, which is a new program at the Department of Agriculture locating and helping agritourism farms. And meaning agritourism, you have people come see your little girls. Mm -hmm. Tell us about them. Yeah, people can come to our farm. They can visit and they can actually see the goats getting milked. They can pet the goats, they can come and look how cheese is being made. Uh, if they come on the right day, they can actually see the cheese being hung and draining the whey out of the curd. And, and taste, I've tasted some fabulous cheeses at your farm. Yes, if you visit really us, if, if you visit us, we'll give you lots of good samples to try. Yeah, that's wonderful. Yeah. Now over here, let's start with dessert. Can we start with dessert? Yes, uh, so we've got some really great items over here. On the top shelf, we've got a goat cheese cheesecake. This is made with a, a Chev cheese. Chev is a spreadable, creamy goat cheese, and it, it's just a, a nice tart cheesecake. And we've got the recipe for this on our website if you ever want to make it yourself, and it's on a graham cracker crust. And then this one? Those are our chocolate. brownie bites. So what brownie that is, bite. they're really good. <laughs> what we do is we make this, we make the brownies from scratch. So we, we start with a brownie base and mm -hmm. then we add a layer of the cheesecake mix on top of it and then we bake that. Mm. So it's kind of like a brownie and cheesecake all in one. Now, goat milk and goat, Chev has that kind of unusual tangy kind of makes your tongue excited. How does that mix with sweets and things? It tastes really good. I mean, the, 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 there's a little bit of tangy, and it just goes really well with the sweets, and you just have to try it. Well, I can't wait till the end of the show when I can oh, run over yeah, we'll and pick one of them and try it because they certainly do look beautiful. And what then, is this really pretty one down here? Yeah, that's also another goat cheese cheesecake. We just swirled some chocolate in it. So it's, ah, it's the same as what we've got up top. But it's got a little Just presented a little differently. It's just as good. Boy, it looks beautiful. Uh, and these look more traditional. Tell us about the two. Yes. Those are the, our feta cheeses. Feta, as you know, is a drier, crumblier mm -hmm. cheese. It's a little bit more saltier, stronger. So good in salads. Yes. Oh, it's wonderful in salads. salads, yes. The, the plain, the, the classic feta is, is great in salads. Also, our marinated feta is wonderful, too. The marinated feta is our classic but it's marinated in olive oil with garlic, basil, and rosemary. So that's like having your dressing and your yes, crumbles exactly. all in one on your salad. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Don't it, even need a dressing. It's yes. amazing. Yeah, that's good. It does. Sound. Now this just mm. looks beautiful, mm -hmm. and um, I'm not real sure what we have here. This is called chev. Okay. Chev is a French word meaning goat, and that's what the French call a fresh goat cheese. So this is all a, a fresh, spreadable, creamy goat cheese, and I've got a couple different kinds up oh, here. Oh, you do? Mm -hmm. well, well, tell us about crackers or what yeah. you spread it on, anything? Yeah, mm -hmm. so the, the Chev is amazing, first of all, for, for several reasons. For one, it, it's great on crackers and bagels. You can eat it just oh, as a okay. snack. You can also use it to cook and bake with, as we've done here. So what I brought with me today is our classic plain goat cheese. It's, it's extremely versatile. You can use it in many, many dishes. We've got a garlic and chive. Very <laughs> easy. <laughs> <laughs> and then we've also got spider bite. Spider bite is one of our original cheeses spider that we developed. Bite. Yes. Uh, <laughs> it's spider not very bite. Or anything. <laughs> <laughs> no, it's, what it is is it's got honey and ghost pepper. So when you first I bite into it. I thought ghost pepper was real hot. It's very hot. It's very hot. That's why we, we pair it with some honey. Oh. So when you first bite into it, uh -huh. you're not immediately going to be knocked off your socks with the heat. You're going you're gonna to bite into it. You're going to say, oh, this isn't spicy. This is sweet. <laughs> oh, that. And then a minute later, you're going to be like, oh, there it is. Gotcha. So it's, it's got a really <laughs> complex flavor profile. It's, it's a really exciting cheese. We really love it. And you said that you are 
careful with the amount in it that people shouldn't be afraid to try yes, it. Yes, don't you, be afraid. Yeah. Uh -huh. I personally, I don't like super spicy food, so I make it so that I can eat it. Uh -huh. And so it's just, it's nice because you can taste it. You know, you know that it's there, but it's not overpowering. Well, well we will trust you for that and can't <laughs> wait to try that one too. And then these look, and I actually got to put a Linda helping hand. Oh, I was goodness. so excited. Tell everyone about yeah, these. Yeah, these are called goat cheese truffles. A goat cheese truffle is basically uh, a ball of goat cheese rolled in something. So I've got two different kinds. First, I've got a garlic and chive goat cheese. Which is right here. Right That's here. One that mm -hmm. you can that yep. And I've, I've mixed in some bacon. And then I've oh, rolled it in no. crushed... Everybody bacon. <laughs> bacon I've, anyway, yes. And I've rolled it in crushed, crushed pistachios. Oh, so it's wow. a nice, savory truffle. And this looks more like um, something that would be for dessert. after dinner dessert. Yes, yeah, it's a very decadent dessert. Uh, it's a, and a glass of wine. Yes, oh my gosh, <laughs> yes. It is a goat cheese chocolate truffle. And what we do is we take our goat cheese icing. We also make an icing. It, goat it's a, cheese icing. Yes, ma'am. That's a product that you mm -hmm. that you make. Yep, okay. it, it's it's just like one of these cheeses, except uh -huh. it's very sweet. So oh. our icing, it's a lot like a cream cheese frosting, and we like to have that on on breads. In fact. Right here, this is a banana bread that's made with our goat cheese icing. Uh, you can also you can spread the icing directly on the bread. Um, I like to have it on graham crackers with mm -hmm. a slice of strawberry on top of it. But how did you make these truffles with that? Well, you... I started out with the icing, uh -huh. and I add some some vanilla and some melted chocolate, oh and I roll goodness. that into a ball, and then I roll that into some cocoa powder. Oh. You just enjoy this, don't you? I can tell you enjoy making these. Recipes. I love it. Yeah, you have a it's so it's so fun. Can I love it. it. Yeah. yeah. Yep. And then um, this banana bread just yes, does look beautiful. Yes, it is. And I imagine that it's very moist with the addition of mm -hmm, that. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so we actually replaced the butter with our goat cheese icing, and it's, it's so delicious. Okay. And, and by the way, the recipes for these are on the website, so if oh, you ever wow. want to try it. And, and then here's yeah. some things that just look like a nice supper when you're tired and don't want to do too yeah, much Yeah, especially, especially when it's been so hot out uh -huh. and you don't want to spend long hours in the kitchen over a hot stove. Okay. These are some really great light salads. So on top we've got a nice uh, spring leaf lettuce with dried cranberries, some walnuts, and some feta sprinkled on top. This would also be good with some spider bite too. That'd be fun. Mm -hmm. And then this looks so delicious. Mm. It is. This is a watermelon, feta, and basil salad. It's also got some red onion in there. And it sounds like a really strange combination, but when you actually try it, the flavor is just really go together so well. Oh, that wonderful South Carolina sure. watermelon. That, that watermelon yeah. queen would probably love that and recipe. And I love pasta salad. I think yes. that's what we have down yes, here. Yes, it is. This is a pasta salad, and that pasta salad is made with our marinated feta. So it's so quick and easy to make. You just pick the pasta that you want. Here we've used a, a thin spaghetti type of pasta. We add in some of the uh, marinated feta, and then we've also added some uh, uh, the, the tomatoes and peppers, some pepperoni, whatever you Just want. Just round yeah. it out. Uh -huh. Whatever you've yeah. got in the fridge. Well, this has been so delightful to learn Thank about Jill's wonderful um, new life as farmers mm -hmm. and goat, goatsmen, herdsmen. And um, I know people will have questions. And when we come back at the end of the show, we're going to learn all about how to get in touch with both of y'all and find out more. Thank y'all for being with Thank us. You, Thank you, Amanda. Thank you. And fun. now we're going to go to another fun place that we visited. I told you that Spartanburg is a place where urban trees are given the type of care that an urban tree wants to have. I can't think of many places where they're more careful of the selection and planning and culture of the trees. And Kevin Paris at Spartanburg Community College with his co-professor Jay Moore has done a beautiful job landscaping their new campus in downtown Spartanburg. campus of Spartanburg Community College with one of the horticulture professors, Kevin Paris. Kevin, when y'all took over this downtown building, um, what was the initial plan for the landscape? Well, we were moving into a historic facility. This building, before we know it, will be 100 years old. So when we did the next generation of trees, we wanted to make sure that those trees lasted another century. And one of the trees that I see that I think is very charming and makes references to the building is a familiar one in South Carolina, dogwood. 
Right, we have actually dogwood blossoms embedded into the archways of the entries. And so at each entryway, we want to do a grove of different cultivars of dogwood to tie into that symbolism of the building. If you don't mind my saying this, you're kind of a cultivar geek. And tell me about the specific properties of the dogwoods you chose. Well, we chose some hybrid dogwoods that bring in some of the genetics of the native Cornus florida, also Cornus cusa from Asia, and Cornus natalii, which is from the western U.S. And these are resistant to anthracnose, powdery mildew, and have larger blossoms than some of the typical older cultivars of dogwood. As we stand in front of the building and look towards the main entrance, you've got just a little bit of grass because you said you wanted it to seem like a welcome mat. Right, we tried to limit the turf area that we had on this campus so we could reduce water usage and really just have functional turf and minimal aesthetic turf to cut down on those water bills. And you had had some trees that people liked to prune because they thought they were sprawling all over. What choices did you make to help avoid that problem? It's, it's unfortunate on older sites like this, sometimes trees have outlived their effective lifespan. And we had some water oak that were nearing 65 to 70 years of age. And because of the growth growing toward the building, a company had improperly topped those about a decade prior to us moving in. And it caused decay and hollows and so our new trees are dawn redwood, so they'll have a tall conical shape that won't have that branch interference even 50, 60, 70 years from now. And it looks like our bald cypress, and I think you used a relative of the bald cypress in the smaller areas up front. We did. We found in parking islands, because of the limited root zone, bald cypress and pond cypress, we used one called fox red, do great in that compacted low oxygenated soil just like they do in their native habitat in Carolina Bays. I have a real peeve with people who plant things under the windows and then they've got to be pruned every time you turn around. You made some unusual choices and I think for a certain reason. Tell me what you've got under these beautiful windows. Along our foundation out front we picked peewee oak leaf hydrangea and it has prospered well in the, the year that we've had it in place and we combine that with a prostrate plum yew to give that evergreen contrast, and a little bit of uh, Mexican anise as well. So those will all be four to five feet or under and, and easily stay within those bounds with very little effort. And then behind us to screen other parts of the city and to give more shade, what have you chosen back there? Well, this was really nice in the midst of the design process, really after construction began. Our college president, Henry Giles, came to me and said, where can we put a fountain? And then a donor in our community, the Zimmerly family, stepped forward and they really wanted to do something for their good friend, Hans Balmer, who initiated our Spot of Pride program, tree planting and beautification throughout the city. So this fountain came together as an honor to Mr. Balmer for what he did for our community. And you've got a little more diversity in a way up here, um, closer together. What are some of the things that you've chosen? We wanted to sort of tie in with the rest of the campus. The diversity is a little more intense here and we use some Zelkova, we use some Weeping Redbud, Sweet Bay Magnolia, and even a dwarf American holly called Maryland Dwarf that we're excited about the potential of. And I think that holly has an unusual green color that, and when you've got a campus with lots of trees, that you can really paint a picture with different greens, can't you? Can. The greens and the purples and the yellows, it all, all blends together. Um, and again, since you do know so much about cultivars, what I thought was a white oak actually is a little bit different. A swamp white oak, Quercus bicolor. The, the swamp white oak transplants in larger sizes a little bit more readily than the white oak and uh, better adapted to an urban site like this. And then also, I have a feeling that Japanese maples may have a special place in your heart. Um, so tell me what it is that you like about them, how you're using them around the campus. They're very versatile for adding color and texture. Uh, so we tried to use a lot of greens, a lot of weeping, a lot of garnet, burgundy, in our courtyard and throughout the campus just to add spots of color. Well, 
I think everything about this is wonderful. We've got a place where we can come and enjoy the, the, the fountains noises to get away from the sounds of the cities. We can look around us and see birds. We can see the breeze going through the trees. We can find places where the sunlight is already being filtered. It's a beautiful campus. Can we come back in about three or four years and see how things have changed? Please do. And in another five or six and ten after that to see these canopies merge together. Well, I can't wait to see it mature. Thank you so much. Thank you, Amanda. Spartanburg has made a livable community with the addition of their beautiful, beautiful trees. And Kevin is just one of many people who has specialized in seeing that they plant things that will live and flourish and bring joy and, um, and, 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 and culture and just a sense of grounding mm -hmm. to the community. Don't you think trees can really have that oh, sense? Oh, yes. Oh, yes. And in Camden, of course, y'all have so many beautiful trees. And oh, it wouldn't indeed. be Camden without those trees. No, it wouldn't. Yeah, yeah, no. yeah. You've got a beautiful hat on. Oh, well, thank you, thank you. Um, you know, at 2 in the morning you wake up, what's mm -hmm. my hat going to be? And, um, <laughs> so um, Pat McDaniel, who is, um, runs our office for us, made some fans recently, and she got this um, glue mm -hmm. that she sprayed on paper and put together with a popsicle stick in it, you know? And so we got, I got some um, fatsy leaves, and we sprayed the leaves and stuck them together. Okay. <laughs> and then we rolled them up. And, you know, phlox is such a great mm -hmm. garden plant, isn't it? Yeah. It is. And, it is. It's one of my favorites. I do, too. I love it, too. And so it's just been out in the garden. So I put a little phlox in it, and then since it is, we have an agronomist on today, um, we added a little cotton in honor of our <laughs> wonderful, wonderful agronomist, Jonathan Croft, who was kind enough to join us tonight. Thank well, you. I'm glad and, to see you, Amanda. Maybe... Where, where'd you find that at this time of year? <laughs> um, I, I, I had some left over from last okay. year. <laughs> Although, you know, you farmers, y'all, yeah, but it's a little early. It's for a little God. early for that one. <laughs> yeah, it sure does. Oh, goodness gracious. Um, well, we've got another caller, and Pat is calling us from North Carolina, a beautiful town in North Carolina, Tryon. Hey, Pat, thank you for calling us, and is it nice and cool up there? Well, it's nice and cool for a while, and then it's nice and warm for a while. <laughs> yeah, yeah Triad is... And we've had wonderful rains. Oh, well, y'all have... A, you have a green community. Triad is always so pretty. Well, what's happening up there that we might be able to help you with? Well, um, I have um, squash plants and cucumber plants uh -huh. that yesterday, when I went out to take care of them, I notice that there is a gray suede-like film on the leaves. Oh. Not on any of the other plants, no tomatoes, nothing else. Mm -hmm. Just those two, you know, those two variety. I mean, those two plants. Okay, okay. Well, and those are... And I have no idea what it is or where it came from or why. Okay, those are cucurbits. Mm -hmm. And uh, right. she's got a grayish film on the leaf. And um, it's been... Sounds like powdery mildew. Sound, that's it, what it sounds yeah. like. Yeah. And, um... And it, you don't even have to have water for powdery mildew, but how about but humidity mm -hmm. is a factor? Is that right? It is. So, mm -hmm. um, just a, a real simple all-purpose fungicide will help to take care it's of that. It's labeled for vegetables. That's labeled for vegetables. It's, yes. Yeah. And um, and the powdery mildew I think is on the top of the leaves. It's, mm -hmm. it's on the top top of the leaves, and she should be able to make it through the powdery without too much. She should okay. be able to make mm -hmm. it. Yeah, I if have. If it was downy, it'd be I a different downy story. And yes. so. I'm just glad that I got the cucumbers I got because yeah. that's not a so <laughs> pet. Fortunately, you can go and find a fungicide labeled for vegetables, read the directions, use it as it says, and keep on enjoying those cucumbers. Linda's calling us from Columbia, the capital city, which is famously hot, and boy, <laughs> they got it right when they came up with that name for Columbia. Hey, how can we help you? Good afternoon, and thank you for taking my call. I enjoy your show immensely. Thank you. I have some uh, gourd uh, plants, uh -huh. and something is eating the blooms on them, so therefore they're not producing a gourd. <gasps> I don't know what to do about it. I don't know. I don't see any bugs on them or worms on them, and I was just wondering if your panel maybe could help me try and get some gourds this year. <laughs> and do you see the the, the, the flowers are eaten, or do they just fall off, or what exactly is happening? Uh, they bloom, and then the next morning I go over and I go out and look at them, and they just, they've just fallen off. Hmm. Without setting fruit? 
Correct. But you don't see any signs of eating particularly, they just fall off. And they, ju they just fall off. I'll go and I'll look at them and, and they just, they'll just fall right down okay. to the ground. Um, you know, that may be pollination. Yeah. I think that um, it sounds like it may be just a mm -hmm. lack of pollination. What do y'all think? It very well could be. Yeah, the um, heat that we've been having, definitely. And um, just, are those, I wonder if those are the, the male flowers you see, and well, maybe this may is be. just starting mm -hmm. to bloom, kind of like a squash would do, or cucumber vine. Because, if so. I'm not mistaken, they have, tell them how they've got the male and female flower on the same plant. Well, you do, you've got, uh, male flowers will show up about 10 days before the female's flowers people get do. all upset. Oh, they, they do, yeah. they do. Flowers they, and flowers and no fruit. Yeah, nothing, mm -hmm. and then um, about 10 days later, female flowers will start to show up. Uh, and you do need lots of pollinators around. Typically, you know, they will have to be visited about seven to nine times okay. for a fruit set. So, um, you know, if more than likely, I would say it's probably the heat that we've been having. Uh, but also double check, make sure that you've got male flowers and female flowers on the vine. Okay. And uh, the female flower will have a little tiny mm -hmm. fruit right behind it. Mm -hmm. So um, we hope that you'll end up having some gourds because um, they're so much fun to grow. Betty's calling us from Columbia, too. Betty, how can we help you? It looks like on TV, or maybe my rewinding has messed up things. Good evening, Amanda. This is Betty hey, in Betty. Columbia. We're, we're kind of running and out of time, so let me have I your question. I eagerly await seeing your coiffure, your hat, that is, when the time comes. And once again, as you've heard so many people say, we eagerly await the arrival of Making It Grow every Tuesday. And the reason I'm calling is... As I'm sure you are all aware and have heard, something called the metal. Do you have a, a an input on how to get rid of it? We have been in our home since 1962. My husband used to be the gardener, and I am now, and I'm fighting the the terrible devil. And what, I don't know what the metal is. Does anybody, is anybody, is that, oh, the nettle, nettle, oh, okay. Like the, uh, the horse oh, nettle, horse Carolina, metal? Carolina yeah, horse yeah. nettle. Anybody yeah. got any suggestions? It would, if it's center of lawn, there are some, we could possibly do some herbicides in the lawn to pre-emergent and post-emergent mm -hmm, to take mm -hmm. care of it. And flower beds, I'm afraid we're looking at probably doing some uh, heavy mulches to okay. try and smother it okay. out. Uh, I'm not aware of any herbicides okay. that you could use in there. So um, if it's in your lawn, um, check with your local extension office and ask them for this. Too late for a post-emergent. You might hurt your grass this time of year. Yeah. But find out it's... about a pre-emergent, and we hope that that can help you so that y'all can enjoy being back in the garden. Okay. Um, Jackie, we thank you and your wonderful guests for coming, and I know people would like to know more about both of your um, pursuits, so tell us how we can find out. Thank you, Amanda. It has been a pleasure to be on here uh, again this evening. To find out more about the South Carolina Especially Food Association, please go to our website, www.scsfa.org. You can look at our members page and find all of our members. You can look at our events page and find out where you can come and taste products. Also, follow us on Facebook. And the new Department of Agriculture has the new program for agritourism. It not only helps the farmers with um, their farms getting um, people to come visit them, but it also we are trying to help the public find the farms. And one of the new programs is the Todd's program, which the directional signs, and they are popping up all over the state. Just last week, Old McGaskill's Farms got their Todd sign erected on 521, and I just found out last week, Melinda, you will be getting your Todd sign sometime this summer, so it'll make it easy for people to find Fishing Creek Creamery. Great. But in the meantime, how can everyone find out more about your farm? Everyone can visit our website, www.fishingcreekcreamery.com. They can follow us on Facebook, facebook.com slash fishingcreekcreamery. And they can also come out to the farm and visit the girls. Thank you very much. Thank you. Okay. Um, and I want to wish Jackie a happy birthday, and I think she's going to take a sea voyage with her dear husband, <laughs> who we have come to love as much as we love her, to celebrate that happy event. Have a grand time. Thank Teresa, you. thank you. I wish that you were taking a sea voyage, but I know you've had a good summer vacation, and we sure are glad that you're back. It really means a lot to us to have you here with us every week. 
I so enjoy the opportunity to be here. Sorry that I had to miss last week, but we had a great crowd in the chat room tonight, up to 29 people. Remember, if you need information about gardening, we're accessible all week through Facebook. And also the Clemson Home and Garden Information Center is a wonderful resource with all kinds of information that can help you with your gardening problems. Amanda, back to you. Okay. You know, we have um, another Clemson program that shares space on SCE TV's programs and that is your day on July the 15th um, oh, on Thursday July the 17th excuse me um, James Blake and Millie Davenport and Corey Tanner are going to be there answering questions and you know they were some smart people with good answers mm -hmm. Jonathan you are a smart guy thank <laughs> you for helping the agricultural center our state and for joining us tonight well thank you for having us and we are so tickled that you came and had a day do you think thank he you. might get you to come back Yes, definitely. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you for having you me. tell all your master gardeners that we said hello. I will. And we'll um, look forward to having you again. We will have a, an evergreen show next week because we're going to be um, traveling, and we hope know you'll enjoy it. We'll see you then. Making It Grow is brought to you in part by Santee Cooper, South Carolina's state-owned electric and water utility. More information on green power and energy conservation programs online at SanteeCooper.com. The South Carolina Department of Agriculture, reminding you that certified South Carolina agricultural products help make South Carolina grow. McLeod Farms in Macby, South Carolina. This family farm offers seasonal produce, including over 22 varieties of peaches. Glory Foods, celebrating Southern food with a soulful heritage. Glory Foods, a way of inviting South Carolina back to the dinner table. FTC Diversified, a proud part of your local communities, providing communication, entertainment, and security. Art Fields, a 10-day art competition in Lake City, South Carolina. Additional funding provided by International Paper.